Hello and welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Hopkins, and today I'm going to be joined by somebody who actually, uh, in some degree, helped get my career started, so I'm very excited to have him on here. Uh, Chris Blunt, uh, you know, Chris, thank you so much for joining us here on the show today. Great, happy to be here. So uh, first of all, um, for those who don't know you, I think it's always nice just uh, kind of quickly give a little rundown of uh, your current role. We'll go through your story, but uh, just you know, where are you today and, and what do you do, Chris? Sure. So I'm the president and CEO of F&G or uh, Fidelity and Guarantee Life. Awesome. And, uh, you know, I've known you for a while now, so I really appreciate you uh, taking time to come on the show. And, and we will get to that eventually part of your story. Probably it's actually my story. It's not yours. It probably doesn't uh, measure a big reading on there. But <laughs> uh, I, I really do appreciate your time. I've looked up to you for, for a long time and have been, you know, somebody who I've reached out when I've had interesting questions throughout the years. Um, but one, one I like to start with the icebreaker is uh, food. So, you know, you've been a New York City person for a while, and obviously food's big in New York too. So do you have a favorite food item or dish or, or cuisine or somebody, you know, anything about food that you'd love to share? Wow. Yeah. I, I, I might answer it differently, which is probably what I miss most right now is like a good old burger at a bar. Yeah. <laughs> so they're big, you know, when it's just the two of us, we love to just go sit at the bar and eat. And so there's a place down the street from our apartment in New York called PJ Clark's. And, you know, it's kind of a good Sunday afternoon, watch a football game, have a burger. So yeah. that I miss. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, probably you and like millions of other <laughs> Americans, right? Miss that a lot right the now. Bars miss us not being there. Yeah. Uh, so another question I, I've started to ask in this season of the show is a little bit different. And uh, you might have answered it to someone before, but it's uh, something advisors ask clients a lot. So I thought, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing, which is what was your first experience with money? Like, do you, do you remember it? Like, if you look back, positive or negative, because people come from all over the place on that side. Yeah, I'd say it was negative. You know, when I was a, a kid, I uh, kind of took care of the family finances, probably at the age of 15 or 16. And um, they weren't pretty. So I, you know, I think that was probably a big motivator for me as a young person was to just, you know, not put myself in that same situation. So I'd say originally it was a source of stress and then obviously it became a professional focus for me. Yeah. So, I mean, do you mind, so how did you end up in, kind of in charge of the, the personal finances of your family at that early of an age? Yeah, I think, you know, my dad was a, a lovely guy and a big idea guy. He was never good with money, so tended to spend more than he made, you know, kind of yeah. thing. Uh, back in the 70s where, where I grew up, uh, you know, my mom was just not involved in that aspect of it. So I, I became kind of the, the, the family bookkeeper, as you will. Yeah, and was that an interest? to you at that point or was it really just at a necessity you, you kind of stepped was, in it was more fear <laughs> <laughs> yeah fear can be a motivator right so yeah. awesome well you know thanks for i mean uh yeah so tell me a little bit about your story you know how as you said you, you started with that you know maybe a little bit of a fear-based negative first experience with money and have made a career in the financial world, right? So uh, how did that start to happen? I mean, uh, were you, did you know kind of going into college and early on that you were interested in that? Yeah, no, I would say a lot of really just dumb luck to be quite honest. So um, I grew up in Detroit, as I said, in the seventies and went to University of Michigan. And when I graduated, uh, my first job actually was in the wheel and brake industry. I worked for a wheel and brake manufacturer as most kids from Detroit, end up in the automotive industry, and I literally got a cold call about three years into that from the local branch manager of Shearson Lehman Brothers to be a financial consultant. Uh, his name is Ross Richards. He's still with Morgan Stanley this many years later and still a good close friend of mine. Um, honestly, I had no idea what I was getting into. I just knew that, you know, I had probably, my next promotion was a decade away in my current uh, field and thought, you know, financial services would be more interesting and broad based. And it was just obviously a phenomenal, phenomenal decision. Was that just a, a cold call that he that he called you up on? 
literally, I don't, I don't know where he got my name from, but you know, it was the classic, you know, here you're a hotshot young salesperson and wouldn't you rather work for yourself and have unlimited income and you know, et cetera, et cetera. So <laughs> I think I was finally in training school in Chicago by the time I realized what he'd actually signed up for. And, <laughs> and I'm very proud of the fact that I won the cold call cowboy trophy in training school. So that was the launch yeah. of a career. Yeah. Well, what did, what did, what did winning that uh, trophy entail? Is it, uh, you were you actually doing cold calls right then? Or was it like the, you were the best at the, right, like the training version of the cold call? <laughs> yeah, a little, little bit of both. So partly a numbers game, it gets back to the, you know, fear is a good motivator. I was, you know, one of the younger people in the training class, I think I was 24. And most of my colleagues were late 20s, early 30s that had extensive sales careers and so it was a little bit of just felt I needed to work harder so you know if people were making 40 calls a day I was making 60 there was there was not a lot of rocket science behind it yeah and well what appealed I mean obviously you mentioned right that ability to move up in the other job was limited and you know that is something that appeals people to financial services but I mean it, there was probably more to I mean was there more to that first job than that was it the the person um too that you, you had a connection there and you know what kind of made you change careers there obviously that's a pivotal moment so yeah no I think it's a couple of things and you and you hit on it one was just the sense of controlling your own destiny right that your your personal income wasn't waiting around for your boss to decide that you warranted a promotion or a raise. So that was, that was a driver. I think it was very much the manager who was um, an inspiring and still is uh, individual and really struck me as someone who could be a great mentor and, you know, help give me a track to run on. And so, you know, I had some success very early on and, you know, kind of led my national class of recruits, if you will. So that was a very positive reinforcing uh, gesture. And then the big opportunity was getting pulled into management. You know, I was a sales manager at, you know, the ripe old age of 26. And I think for me, that was the bug of training other advisors, you know, seeing people be successful. You know, it was an interesting conversation. He actually said to me at one point, he said, you know, at some point you have to decide, do you want to back clean up or do you want to manage the team? They seem related, but they're not. They're very different career paths with very different reward structures. And I thought that was a pretty brilliant op observation. And I remember going home that weekend and thinking about it and realizing it was really the coaching and mentoring aspect that I loved more than anything else, but even more so than being in, in personal production. Yeah, so uh, when that happened, right, um, uh, what was, I mean, what went through your mind? Did you said you thought about pieces of it, but, you know, moving out of the sales world and moving up into management, again, really big change, right? And uh, I mean, are there things you wish you would have thought about then too, you didn't? Uh, <laughs> uh, or uh, Yeah, it's a great point. I, I would say, um, at least back then, there wasn't a lot of training on how to be a good manager, you know, so it wasn't, but if you think about it, it's a very big transition. And again, a very different career path. Um, so it was more trying to emulate people that you saw that struck you as good leaders, trying to remember the people that inspired you, um, that you worked for and trying to, you know, mirror some of those behaviors and probably as importantly, not mirror the behaviors of the people you didn't enjoy working for. So, um, yeah, it was probably a little more trial and error. You know, I smile sometimes now because at our firm and most companies, you know, there's very robust training programs for new managers. Uh, most of this, we were kind of winging it through uh, through experience. Yeah, you mentioned a, a kind of two interesting pieces there. One of them, you know, emulating people in the characteristics or behavior that you liked and then avoiding some of them that you didn't like. When you went into management and, and kind of leadership at the beginning, were there, did you have something that you wanted to guide you or were you kind of completely winging it? Because I, I know a lot of like coaches that, right, you, you try to look at something from somebody and be like, all right, well, at least I'll have a guide. I don't know everything, but something can pull me forward. Yeah, I, I'd say probably the biggest thing was this notion of, you know, are you vested in the success of the people who work for you? And I've shared this story before. This came a bit later in my career, but I worked for a woman who, whose name was Loretta McCarthy. 
Um, I was at Oppenheimer Funds at the time. And I remember she came into my office one Monday morning and she said, you know, I was thinking about you and your career over the weekend. And I've said to this day, I don't remember a word she said after that. I was just so touched and blown away that she was actually thinking about me and my career as opposed to what I could do for her. And it was, so that was one of those other watershed moments. So if you say, what's the foot to shore, the theme here, I think for me, it's been that. It's, you know, I view it as somewhat contractual. You know, your job as a leader is to be clear on where you're trying to take the place and what you need each member of the team to do to contribute to that. And then once they do it, the burden falls back on you of, well, what are their aspirations and how do you help them meet them? For some people, it's simply, you don't want to come in and do my job and be well paid. That's great. But for many folks, it's, you know, they want to have a career path. They want to get promoted. They want more responsibility. And so I've sort of always viewed it as, as simply as that. And so, I mean, that's a great story. I mean, I, I think that's, you know, that's probably a very powerful thing. As you said, somebody just, you know, in a leadership role coming coming to you and saying, hey, I was thinking about your career is probably very meaningful, right? As you said, as long as it probably doesn't end with, right, and this is the end of your career. <laughs> you might have remembered that if it happened after, but. Uh, we'll you in ways we might shorten your career. Right? Yeah, <laughs> it might be best suited elsewhere. But, uh, you know, when you, uh, I mean, when you think about kind of moving into leadership and, you know, you had some good mentors along the way. Did you ever ask anyone to be your mentor or did they just kind of develop out of, you know, people or you, you got lucky with some of it or people saw your potential and they kind of gravitated to helping you too? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, I would say, no, I don't think I ever formally asked someone it was more bubble up and I've overseen mentorship programs before at different companies. And I always say the same thing. And there's only so much structuring you could do. Um, and it has to be two way. And so, you know, I think some of it's the art form of asking questions without being overly annoying, you know, pick your spots. But my experience has been mo most people love to teach. And so if you ask them, uh, the vast majority of people love sharing what they know. And the question is, you know, how do you make the ask when? So it's a, maybe the nuances around, you don't want to be a pest who's just constantly asking questions. But I, but I think for me, it was just honestly asking questions and finding those people that responded um, and, and seemed to have an interest in that. I think the other is for mentees, it's important to follow up. You know, I think there's nothing more frustrating than when someone comes to you for help, you, you invest a lot of time and then they just disappear. And you're like, well, did they take any of that advice? They don't have to take it all, but did they take any? Was it meaningful? Was it helpful? You know, how did things play out? And so I think that communication loop is really important. So that was probably one thing that I always prided myself on is, you know, making sure I followed up. And if someone had had an impact or done something that I let them know that. Um, and then I think as you get older in your career and further along, it's also my bringing something to the table. You know, I've been approached over the years by folks who are like, I'd like you to mentor me. And like, okay, I'm a nice guy. I'm, I'm inclined to want to do that when someone asks, but is that it? Like, not to be cynical, but like, what's in it for me? Like, typically my ask would have been a lot different. It would have been, you know, not a, a blatant ask to mentor, it'd be more, hey, I wanted to share some perspective with you, given that I'm in the trenches or whatever, you know, value I thought I might add. People get it and they know what's happening, but it's just, it's a little more subtle. Yeah, I, think, I mean, it is a nice, uh, nice way to rephrase it, right? As you said, uh, you know, the hard ask and, you know, generally right people behave because they, you know, you expect something out of it, even if you're just trying to teach and give back. But I, I think it's a nice way to phrase it. it when you, uh, you, you said you've run lots of mentorship, leadership programs along the way, but um, walk us through your career a little bit. So you, we at least got started here and then we, we yeah. started shifting course already, which is good, right? It, these things ebb and they flow. And so, you know, you, you started off kind of outside the industry, you got brought into the cold calling sales world. You, you clearly decided you didn't want to do cold calls for the rest of your life which, uh, you know, that's a, that's a hard decision to make though, right? <laughs> I think most people want to shift out of that. But, um, and so what are some of the other stops along the way? And, and as you kind of developed, uh, you know, leading people and, and 
some of those big, you know, changes? Yeah, I'd say probably three, four, maybe big milestones in, in, in my career. The first was, yeah, being at Cheerson Lehman Brothers, but I've said this before, you know, now would be Morgan Stanley. I think I learned more in three years of being a broker than anything I've done since. And I really believe that because, you know, and anyone who's, you know, carried the bag and been in the business knows, you know, clients will ask any possible question under the sun and generally not have a lot of patience if you don't know the answer, can't get it quickly. So, you know, I remember when I eventually went to business school, so many of my classmates were like, how do you know so much? And I really didn't, I wasn't all that deep on probably much of anything, but I was really broad. Like I'd been exposed to just about everything from that experience. So I actually really liked it. I had success, I was making good money. And so that was, you know, a path. Um, as I said, I went into management. I loved that. I probably would have, I no doubt would have stayed down that track. Uh, but this was back in 88, Shearson merged with the F Hutton. They were shutting down branches right and left. I was the low, I was the youngest manager out of 400 in the system. So it's pretty clear I wasn't going to get another managerial gig anytime soon. So I'd been taking evening MBA classes and decided to go finish my MBA. So I went to Wharton in 88. I got out in 1990. Um, and then really kind of, again, you know, just good luck. I stumbled into uh, the asset management business in 1990. If you plot growth of assets under management, it was just a fantastic time to come into the industry. So I spent the next 17 years in the asset management business, um, a variety of different places, uh, Oppenheimer, uh, I was at Goldman Sachs, which was probably my big opportunity. I was the national sales manager for Goldman Sachs funds in the 90s. Um, and then I went to Merrill Lynch and uh, eventually went and ran a startup called Giving Capital, which I'll come back to later, but we pri private label donor advised funds. And that's where sort of this passion around philanthropic planning and the cap designation at the American College. That's where I met Phil Kibetta. Um, so that was really just a wonderful experience. Made absolutely no money, but I learned a ton. <laughs> and, it was terrific. Um, and then at the end of that, tried to figure out what did I want to do next? And I was recruited by New York Life, really being groomed to run their third party asset management business. So I was in an asset management role for a couple of years. And the newly minted uh, CEO, who's still there, Ted Mathis, had asked me to come over to the parent company um, in 2007. So I came into the insurance space in 2007, uh, all told, spent about 13 years uh, with New York Life. Really loved it, loved the annuity space, the life space. Um, briefly retired in 2017. By briefly, I think I lasted about four or five months. <laughs> um, and I got a call from Blackstone, who was looking for someone to come build out their insurance solutions business. So I did that. I joined them as a, as a senior managing director and CEO of that business. Um, and frankly, in early 2019, had an opportunity, uh, was approached by the board of uh, F&G, where I work now, uh, was looking uh, to make a change at CEO. Um, and with Blackstone's permission, because Blackstone manages all of our money, I uh, decided to take, take the position. So that's, that's kind of the twisted path. I would say it's first half of the career was wealth management, asset management. Um, second half of the career has really been in the insurance and annuity space. Yeah, I actually think that dynamic, not that it's unheard of, but it's interesting, right? I'd say probably more of the world, at least that I run into now, has gone the other way, right? Like where they started in the insurance world and then went to asset management. But um, so do you think that gave you just kind of a different perspective when you have been in right now, um, what are almost what the... 13, 14 years, right, in the insurance world, a different perspective, having spent so much time on the fund and asset management uh, world. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. In fact, at one point within New York Life, I, I literally, within a day, went from being the guy responsible for all the products and the liabilities to the asset management guy. And we were negotiating fee exchanges between the two business units. And so literally on a Friday, it was pounding the table, you know, paying too much. And on Monday I came in and I said, we're not getting paid enough and you know, a lot of laughter. But um, I think the reality is it was great experience. Um, clearly now when you look at what's happening in the annuity space where your ability to invest well in this environment 
is arguably the most important factor. I mean, it's about 80% of our risk capital is spent on the investment side. And so I think it's important. You have to understand the liabilities. You have to understand the products on the insurance side. Insurance investing is different. You know, I always say to people, regular investing is two-dimensional. It's risk and return. Insurance investing is like eight-dimensional and the, and, and the dimensions keep changing on you. You know, you've got ALM limits. You've got you know, multiple different rating agency capital regimes. You've got different regulatory regimes that you're trying to fit within. And so um, it's more complex. I find it much more interesting. And so, yeah, right now for me, a perfect day is, you know, I'm out spending some time with our distribution partners and getting a chance to interact with advisors, but then I'm sitting in an investment committee meeting, I'm brainstorming with our product people. You know, it's just, it's a fun space. So there, there's no doubt it's whether, you know, I'd love to say it was strategic, it was more luck, but um, I think it was a good background for what I'm doing now. Well, uh, I'll ask one more question here tied to that, then we'll go back in time again. But what do you think, I mean, it's a pretty challenging space, right? You said eight dimensional, maybe there's more, but who knows. But it's a pretty challenging space right now, at least in my opinion, for insurance investing, right? I mean, for the insurance companies to invest, right? where you know interest rates used to be much higher you could ride a lot of that right now you know how does that impact today like long term decisions product decisions distribution decisions cuz it's not as simple like hey we just pick a new portfolio and we keep doing all the same things totally agree yeah i think you know i i tease some of my friends i've got to meet a number of insurance company cios in the last few years I tease them that, you know, in the glory days when, you know, they got wined and dined by all the investment banks and, you know, you do your research and you got as much of the bond as you wanted. And it was a, it was a pretty good gig. It was everybody <laughs> being an insurance company CIO was a pretty good job. It's a brutal job today. You know, every bond is oversubscribed. Yields are non-existent. And that's why I think, Jamie, you've seen this dynamic now where a number of annuity providers have now partnered with private credit managers, because it's not enough to just manage what's out there in the public space, because there's very little yield. It's can you go out and originate deals? Can you talk to um, companies with assets and structure senior financing? So in some ways, they've taken the place of the investment banks to a degree. So they're not only managing and doing the credit work, but they're bringing you opportunities with hard assets and real cash flows structuring these these senior financings because you know you need to stay in the realm of investment grade very few insurance companies and we're no different have much more than four or five percent of their portfolio in non investment grade but if you can eke out on even a small portion of your portfolio a couple hundred basis points of yield and still be in the single a triple b category it's unbelievably impactful in fact i would argue like our business is booming right now um, and you would say, well, wow, rates are down and the 10 years gone from almost 3% to 70 basis points. You know, how is that? Well, that's because if, if you've got an inherent 20 or 25 basis point edge, it's even more impactful when rates are this low. You know, if you can offer a 2% rate on a fixed deferred annuity and a CD's at 70 basis points and your competitors at 175, that's really meaningful to a client as opposed to being at five and a quarter and someone else is at five. So long answer to your question, but I think the real key is, do you, are you partner with a manager that can also originate opportunities, not just, you know, oversee what's in the, in the liquid markets because more and more companies have been going private, more of the financings are private. Um, if you don't have that access, and I think that's why you're seeing, Firms that have one of those partners, you know, we're partnered with Blackstone, Athena's partnered with Apollo, KKR just bought Global Atlantic. Those tend to be the firms that are gaining all the market share right now. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I love that. That was a great explanation, too, of just that, that dynamic between, which I'm glad you went there, actually, which was that dynamic between what you can get on your back end investing side to the product, right? Like, 
that's the thing I think a lot of people miss, right, is that it actually does shape the competitiveness of the product you deliver. And you're right, like if you're 25 basis points higher in today's environment, that as a percentage of the return that, or payout that you're giving somebody is very significant, right? When you're at five, six, seven, 25, 15 basis points might not matter as much. Um, but today, uh, kind of an incredible differentiator there on the product and solution side. So I really like that. Uh, going back, um, you, you kind of mentioned this, and this will bring to some of my personal aspects to you. Is you, So you went out and started uh, kind of your own endeavor. So what was the, the reason for that? Why did you decide, you know, I'm, I'm going to go out and start my own place? Because I, I think a lot of people have that entrepreneurial, but you made the jump. So <laughs> you said you didn't make a whole lot of money. So <laughs> yeah. It's funny. In fact, in fact, when I was um, interviewing at Blackstone, I was interviewing with Steve Schwartzman actually, and he was obsessed. You know, here I thought I'd done all these impressive things, and he literally spent the entire interview talking about my experience of giving capital. And I was finally feeling guilty, and I said, "Steve, I got to be honest with you. Like, I didn't make any money, and I don't think my investors made me money either." And he said, "I love it even more. What did you learn from that?" And I and I remembered that was such I thought a brilliant insight and I said, oh well, where do I start? You know, I learned this, I learned that, you know, so back to the, even though something might not be commercially successful, one, it was my first CEO opportunity. And you just, it's just different. If you've never done it before, it seems like it's a natural progression, but it's just different when you're kind of the last decision maker. So that was one. But the passion for me was more, you know, you know, can I do something where I take the skills that I've learned but where there's kind of a broader end game. You know, it's not just about making money, which is always nice, but, you know, I'm doing something to kind of move society forward. And so, you know, the, the tagline of giving capital was democratizing philanthropy. This was when donor advised funds had first taken off and Fidelity had one and Vanguard had one, but most firms didn't offer them. So we built a turnkey product. We had a product, we had the charitable piece, we had all the technology so that we can make it easy for a firm to say, yeah, I'll offer one of those, one of those products. Um, and it was great. And we sort of signed up a who's who of organizations. But I think what it really did for me was I spent a lot of time with advisors who were in the field of philanthropic planning. I met Phil Cubetta, who had been at New York Life, now at the American College, running the CAP program, the Certified Advisor in Philanthropy. So it's always, for me, it's been about a 20-year passion now of can I help take you know the 500,000 financial advisors that are out there and get them more involved in planned giving and charitable planning. Not just because it will produce more funds for, for um, you know, admirable nonprofit organizations, that's a big part of it. But I also think most advisors are missing an opportunity. Like when you, if you and I start engaging on what you're actually really passionate about, and we stop talking about insurance and you tell me about the nonprofits you support and, what kind of world you want your kids to live in. It, you just, the, the relationship you have with a client is just permanently better. Yeah, I've, it's taken me, I don't know, I don't know if I say a long time, but that's been one of my biggest realizations in the past year was, uh, you know, spending time with clients on their charitable endeavors. And you're right, like you kind of realize what's more so what somebody is like at that point, right? Like what do they really deeply care about? And you can get to like deeper level of sharing at that point too, right? Because all of a sudden it's, you know, the purpose behind a charity is usually deeply personal, right? Like there's no other way around. It's very rarely, right. well, we picked this charity because it had the best tax benefits. Well, they all have the same. So that's, you know, was not the driver <laughs> for anyone picking a particular charity. Um, you know, and then Phil, uh, yeah, I've, uh, I have not finished the CAP program. Maybe, maybe by the time this comes out, you know, I'll be close to done. But I, like, I started it this year in part because of that experience. And uh, you know, Phil was a, a, you know, a really great teacher to me when I was at the college. And a funny story about that too, right? The Wallaces, who were, you know, helped kind of with sure. some of the the contributions to be able to let it go. Um, I started at the American College and I called up uh, my grandfather whenever I told him that I was getting the job and I go, I'm, I'm work at this place, American College, I'm going to be teaching there. And, you know, the, his, his, historically the CLU, big insurance, and I think I had accepted the 
the uh, New York Life physician at the retirement center there too. And he goes, oh, well, I, I knew somebody that was big in the insurance business. If you ever run across his name, let me know. And so literally it was Bill Wallace. Um, <laughs> but it, my, my grandfather and him grew up uh, playing football together and then actually like reconnected, I think in like their 60s, because they both played tennis um, in Delaware. Like very random thing. And I, I like, I think I get there and there's a big like, you know, painting of him. <laughs> like right there. So. And I was like, Pat, I think he's like on the painting outside my door. So uh, it was a very interesting connection there. So um, obviously at that point, um, well, I guess I, I do want to hear a little bit about that lesson. It almost seems like, how did you exit that business then, right? You get involved, you meet people like Phil, who was at New York Life, American College, so you create some of those connections. But um, what was the end of the business? Did you shut it down? Did you sell it? Did you just leave? Yeah, great question. So we sold it. And I would say we sold it not because we wanted to, but frankly, it was a difficult period of time to raise fresh capital. And we had investors that weren't all on the same page. One wanted to fund it and keep it going. Others wanted to cash out, you know, and simply move on and, and do other things. And so at some point, you just can't make the math work. You can't make it come up with a deal that makes everybody happy. Um, so ultimately, we sold it. We sold it to a software firm out on the West Coast. It's actually still, it's still the Intel inside on probably half the donor advised funds out in the industry right now. So, Well, well that's what I was going to ask. I was going to say, like, if you had made it till now, it probably would have done okay, right? Because you, especially what the last four or five years, you've had this huge influx of money into donor advised funds. But yeah, <laughs> it's probably pretty massive. I mean, at the time, I think we had raised $800 million dollars. Okay. Security. So um, that's actually where I met my wife. We, she was one of the uh, co-founders of the business. And so she reminds me it was priceless because I met her, but um, which is true, just for the record. Yeah, it was a good return. <laughs> the other is, you know, we jokingly said we front loaded our philanthropy. It was, it was a pretty good venture. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a personal money maker, but uh, we, we did raise a lot of money for, for some very worthy causes. So it was good. Nice. And so after you sold that, what was the what was the next step right after you sold it? So, I mean, you sell it and you, did you know where you were going by the time you sold it or did you have to figure that out after you um, get done? <laughs> uh, no, yeah, actually I think the sale probably closed when I was at New York Life. But yeah, the next part of the chapter was uh, I literally got a call from someone I had worked with uh, briefly at, at uh, Merrill Lynch who had just gone to New York Life as president of their asset management business, guy named Brian Murdoch, who said, hey, we've got this mutual fund complex you know, this is right up your alley. It's kind of struggling. It's a turnaround, but the parent company is a mutual. They're willing to invest in the business. You know, it could be a lot of fun. You'll have a lot of autonomy. So I think what was appealing for me is it was um, what I call chicken entrepreneurship. And it's become, I guess, a bit of an expertise of mine of can you build sort of an entrepreneurial startup, but under the umbrella of a larger company? Because I was at a point where I'm like, okay, I haven't had a real paycheck in three years. I probably should try to try to get one of those, but I wasn't ready to go back into a giant, you know, Fortune 100 company with a lot of bureaucracy. And so this was working for someone that I knew and liked, um, knowing I'd have some autonomy and it was a build, which is what I love. You know, it was a growth story. It wasn't go acquire your way to greatness. It wasn't a cut cost to greatness. It was a, we believe in the business, put a business plan together. If it's thoughtful, we'll fund it and, and let it grow. And, um, and it was just, a, it was a great, just a phenomenal, phenomenal run it was a you know i was able to assemble a really good team and you know we went from a couple billion in sales to you know i think at the peak we were doing 25 30 billion in sales so it was yeah. it was one of those just handful of great opportunities that you get in your career and uh what uh, kind of precipitated or caused the the move within side of new york life too i mean was that just you know, looked at you and said, hey, you're the right person to take on more here um, on kind of the core business. It, it was, it, was it from that success, I guess, that you, <laughs> you, you build yeah, a piece up? Yeah, I guess it was a couple of things. It was, um, you know, I got to know Ted Mathis, who when I was running the funds business, he was running, um, you know, the life and annuity business and liked him. It was very clear that he was smart. We would brainstorm quite a bit about different distribution challenges we had and the business both shared this kind of passion and vision around the whole retirement income opportunity and SPIAs in particular. And 
So I think that was a bit of, a bit of a bonding. And then he, he literally just invited me to dinner one night and said, hey, would you consider coming over to the parent company? And um, so he hired me as his uh, COO of the life and annuity business. So from that uh, became the retirement income business, which I ran for a while and then uh, was co-president of the life businesses. And then the last couple of years of my career there, I ran uh, the investment group, which was the global asset management business and the annuity business. But again, it was back to, you know, I liked and admired the person. And I thought, here's an interesting opportunity. You've got, a, I think he was all of 39 years old at the time, about to take over a Fortune 7,500 company, um, asking me to join his team. It seems like you know, kind of opportunity you don't get twice in your career. And so it was, it was a great decision and I loved it. And we just, we had a lot of fun together. Yeah. I mean, it, it, Ted's awesome. And it's, uh, I'm glad you made the decision too. And uh, you, were you part, I think you were, if I, I wasn't in that meeting, so I'm going to ask, but you were part of the initial kind of decision group to essentially support the American college and then build out the retirement income center and then the RICP eventually too. Yeah, I think the um, the original architect was actually Fred Siever. So I think Fred gets yeah. gets credit uh, for that. I think I got involved pretty quickly. That would have been probably 07, 08, when I came over to the parent um, as we were looking to grow the retirement income business. I think that's where I got involved. And I think the original iteration of the center had become a, a little more academic publishing and, and a little less, I guess, practical or um, type of stuff. So that, that was probably where I got the most involved was, you know, the, the focus around that, helping to the build out of the RICP designation, which has been, as you know, massively, massively successful. And so that, that was kind of a fun thing to be involved and see it evolve to where it is today, which I think is quite impactful. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's been really amazing. I mean, that's something that I look back on very fondly. I mean, I, I got to come in and help build that out. And uh, you know, I don't know the total number off the top of my head now, but at least when I left the college in that role two years ago, I think we were at 18,000 people had signed up for the RICP advisors and agents. And like, that's pretty amazing, right? That's, <laughs> that is broad impact when you think about all of those individuals and taking that, you know, information about income planning down to their clients. I mean, it's reshaping, right? Literally a generation of you know, retirees out there. And um, obviously you got really interested in retirement income planning. What, what was kind of, did you remember what kind of shifted your mind and said, hey, wow, this, this distribution period is actually really important, right? You, you came through the asset management and back in the 90s, right, none of them were worried about distribution and income planning, right? That wasn't, that wasn't really kind of a, a front and main stage item then. Yeah, I think a lot of it, to be honest, is I'm, you know, uh, a nerd. And so the math matters to me. And I, and I always find that interesting. You know, in 1991, I was going to go get my PhD at the University of Chicago in, in finance. So I'm a frustrated academic, I guess, at, at heart. Um, and so I've always had an interest in that. And I remember, um, you know, just sort of going through the academic literature around income annuities and, you know, uh, you know, mortality pooling, et cetera, et cetera. And it was, it, you know, it's irrefutable. And it was just one of those things that became a little bit of an obsession of like, why don't more people understand this? Why don't advisors talk about this? And I realized part of it was, part of it was a, um, a lack of knowledge. So there was just simply educating folks on the math. But part of it was very much a, a business model challenge, which still continues today, as you know. You know, the advisory world had moved to gather assets under management and charge fees. And in walks a guy from New York Life or wherever it was and says, hey, I got a great idea. Why don't you irrevocably hand up 30% of those assets to an insurance company because it's the right thing to do. And so I, I think it just became a bit of a personal passion for me. Part of it too is, you know, it hadn't been that long since I've been a financial advisor. If the, the most heartbreaking clients were the ones that came to you too late. And I'll never forget this. I was maybe a month in the business and this woman came to see me. She was in her 60s and, you know, was like almost on the verge of tears and looking for my help. I think she was referred to me by a friend of mine. But the reality is she had saved little to no assets. 
she wasn't working. She was a widow. And I just remember what a hopeless feeling it was. I went home and I thought, I, there's a, sadly very little I can do from here other than to keep her from losing what little she has or someone giving her very bad advice, which I did my best to do. But so I guess it was a little bit of a realization of, of most boomers in particular, and that's my, my vintage, hadn't done a particularly great job of saving. And it was a sense of if they screw up the distribution phase, they're done. Because when you're younger, the only advantage you have is time. You can make a lot of investing mistakes when you're in your 20s, and it kind of doesn't matter. But when you get into your prime earnings years, you need to make some smart decisions. But by the time you're 60, if you haven't saved enough money and you're unrealistic on your withdrawal rate, I'm preaching to the choir, right? You can you can blow things up in a heartbeat. And, and I saw, I saw relatives who'd made decisions where they just – they thought they were rich because they had $300,000 saved and they blew through half of it in the first five years of retirement. And so it, it, as you can tell, it's just one of those things. And, and maybe it was because of, you know, being the family bookkeeper at 16 or whatever, where I just, you know, I've always been a realist of like, are people setting realistic goals? Do they know how much money they actually need? And then once they have it, do they have a thoughtful plan to spend it down? Or is it just a wing and a prayer? And I just saw too many instances where financial advisors were sometimes guilty as well of, you know, I tell you, you can take out 6%. You like me better than the person who said you can only take out five. <laughs> and guess yeah. what? We're both wrong. The odds of not running out of money are, are, are you know, quite high. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, speaking about that, right, you, you went and uh, gloriously retired, right? For, as you said, a whole <laughs> short uh, four or five months. I, I think I went to at least two events where we celebrated your retirement. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And my friends are done. They're like, if you ever retire again, there's no, there's no more gifts. There's no more. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess uh, realistically, right. You kind of knew pretty quickly after, right. You, you probably weren't really done yet. Right. You still had more to give and uh, you know, now kind of in the second role after that too. So what, what was it that enticed you back? that quickly i mean did you just realize like a weekend that i gotta go do something or what yeah, happened you know, and, hey you know our spouses always know us better than we know ourselves right and my so my wife pegged it in very early on because i was i was dead set on a path of i had a couple board opportunities and was pretty involved and, and still am in some nonprofit activities so i wasn't worried that i would be bored her point was your passion is is developing and leading teams and you don't get that as a board member. You're part of a team, but you're part of a team four times a year. And I remember it was a very insightful comment. I was probably cranky at the time because I probably knew she was right. And so I think it was that. And, and so the Blackstone opportunity was interesting. Like originally I thought it'd just be fun to run around and talk to all my colleagues, you know, fellow you know, CEOs and CIOs of insurance companies and talk about alternative investments, which is what we all think of Blackstone for. But it was in that very first week of meetings where I realized, wow, they're the largest originator of debt in the world. And that is actually what insurance companies need. They need investment grade debt with higher yield. And they were really passionate. Most of my conversations were about the societal impact, not how much money we can make if we gather assets. And obviously they're a very successful firm. They're a very commercial firm. They're not a nonprofit, you know, I'm not, I'm not implying that, but, but it mattered to them as senior people of, hey, we can really help. This is something that we're really good at. So that kind of fired me up and it went from an interesting job opportunity that was contemplating to this, this could really be quite impactful. And then same thing, I think with the F and G opportunity, you know, it became pretty clear to the folks at Blackstone and myself included that the near term path to success was, can we quadruple the size of, of F and G? And I got to know a number of the executives there, it was of a, of a size, it was a growth opportunity. It felt like the experience I had at New York Life and at Goldman Sachs before that. So everything felt right. And this opportunity of most important to me, can you come in and really have a disproportionate say in the culture that is built? And that's something that I think I'm most proud of. I inherited a great culture but I think we've leaned into it and I think people really enjoy, they feel good about our mission. Our mission statement is to you know, help people turn their aspirations into reality. And I think that resonates with our employees. They volunteer a lot. 
they're, they're very involved in, in local communities. And so kind of this idea of, can you, can you create an environment where really good people want to come into work? They love what they do. They have a good career. And at the end of the day, they go home and go, you know, I did something admirable today. And, you know, cause what we do is admirable, right? On the life insurance side, we, you know, we preserve families. On the annuity side, we give people protections. We give people guaranteed lifetime income is admirable stuff. And sometimes in our industry, we're so close to it, we forget that that's really what it's all about. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it has an absolutely enormous societal impact, right? Of, of securing people's finances in their lives. And I mean, as you knew, right? Going all the way back to your childhood, right? Somebody's got to do that. And yeah. <laughs> you stepped in out of fear and hopefully others can, can step in uh, not only on fear times too, but you've mentioned it a handful of times. And so I don't want uh, us to close out before we talk about it, but obviously, right, the charitable side, the impact side is important to you. So what are you, uh, what are you inclined to do on that side today? Where, where do you and your wife perhaps give or want to give or have that impact as you move forward? Yeah, so I'd say a couple of areas. So, um, you know, I've been on the board um, of the YMCA of Greater New York for probably 12, 13 years now. And it's just one of those things that just kind of gets in your blood. And so that's um, been a big passion and spend a fair amount of time there. They, they just, they do great work. It's a lot more than swim and gym. You know, they run senior centers and new American welcome centers. And so the breadth of the organization is pretty, pretty staggering. So that's been a lot of fun. We do spend time there. A lot of our giving lately has been food banks. You know, there's a massive crisis going on in the, in the world of COVID. And so a lot of the near-term cash gifts we've made have been there. Um, and then recently we made a gift to the American College um, around uh, philanthropy um, to try to do a couple of things. One, encourage more financial advisors, as we spoke before, to embrace charitable planning, particularly in communities of color. Um, and then the other, uh, frankly, is just to be uh, supportive of the overall CAP program, the, you know, Chartered Advisor and Philanthropy. So that's, that, that's probably two thirds of what we spend our, our time on. Yeah, well, and, uh, thanks for, you know, giving back to, to all of them. Yeah, the food bank is... You know, and that's where, you know, this month I, I gave to and uh, one of my good friends, Tyrone Ross is, uh, you know, he's always hammering on that, all the other stuff, literacy and teaching people to swim or play sports they can't do if they're hungry. Right. And, and I always love that message. It resonates with me so much because it's like, yeah, we want to do all this other stuff. But if kids are going to bed hungry, people can't eat. They're not going to do any of the other things. Um, yeah. And then the why I still think of it as swimming. So I, I swam all the way through college. And yeah, that I know they do other things. But I, 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 I don't I actually I did learn um, how to swim at the Y, right? The little toddler thing with my, my mom probably dunking my head under. So and that took me all the way through college. So it, it <laughs> big impact on my life. Then obviously American College, uh, headed up by a, another former uh, a New York Life individual now too, uh, President George. So yeah. he's over there, which uh, no great leader also. So uh, New York Life does have a, a good uh, track record of creating some fantastic leaders out there too. So that's pretty. Yeah, awesome. and I think I think to their credit, it's uh, it's a legacy thing. You know, it's a 175 year old institution, and they, they just think in legacy terms, and that's a that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it's amazing when you think about a company that's that's been around that long, right? I mean, yeah, there there are some, but it's a it's not a huge group that gets to pass the hundred year mark, let right. alone <laughs> even further. So, uh, you know, uh, Chris, I, I think uh, just here at the end, I mean, any closing comments on? Uh, I think one of your best perspectives is that ability to kind of build a culture, right, and leadership in a company. Any closing remarks for people who, you know, that maybe they're, they're smaller companies now or they, they aspire to, to go that route of things that they could do to kind of develop as leaders and then build that culture they want around them? Yeah, I, I would say a few things. One, I, I keep going back to the mission statement. Do you have one and is it real? You know, we've all probably worked at companies where there's some sign with some lofty phrase, but folks don't really live up to it, or it's, it's just too generic, you know, saving the world for tuna fish, I don't know. But um, so, you know, whereas I think we spent a lot of time on ours, and I take personal pride in it, you know, we had a team that gave a lot of input, but it ultimately, 
I think if you're the leader of the organization, the first thing you have to put your imprint on is the mission, unless you've inherited a very clear mission. What is our mission statement? Why do we deserve to exist? So that would be one. The second is, you know, there was this great book, um, and I, I'm embarrassed that I don't remember the author's name, but it was called, Why Should Anyone Be Led By You? And it was a great provocative title. And um, you know, we sort of sat through a seminar, and at the end of it, they handed out copies of the book and had your name on it. So yours would say, why should anyone be led by Jamie Hopkins? And you know, you have it sitting on your credenza and you walk in every morning, it's a great reminder of, hey, if I can't answer that question, well, why should people be excited about being part of the organization? So I would say, you know, be clear about your mission, make sure you have sort of a pithy answer to that. Why should someone be led by me? And then everybody doesn't have to be Tony Robbins, you don't have to be the most gifted speaker or the most charismatic. You can be very effective, low key leader, but really thinking about like, what, why should someone work for me? Because if you can then articulate that, I learned this lesson a long time ago, your job is to hire people smarter than you to come work for you. And not even to come work for you, but come work with you. you know, so have a, have a vision, have a mission statement, be clear on what the value prop is, and then just treat people well, treat them decently. And when you screw up, admit that you screw up. I had one of those moments recently where I'm like, I was tired, I was cranky, I pride myself on not raising my voice, and frankly, I was just being a little, a little shit on a phone call. And you know what? It occurred to me, there's only one thing to do now, I gotta, I gotta just go apologize. And that's what I did. And I called a video conference with the people on the call, and I said exactly what I just said to you. You know, that wasn't one of my finest moments, and that's not how I like to lead. And so you guys deserve an apology, and I apologize. And, you know, my sense is those things go a long way. People, you know, the old adage of, you know, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So I think that's it. Uh, but you have to sincerely care. You know, if you're faking it, people see through that. Well, Chris, I just want to thank you for coming on the show. Really appreciated your time here, spending all this time with us, you know, getting personal about, you know, your first experience with money, you know, missing uh, burgers out there at, at the local spot, you know, for all of your leadership and impact, your impact on my career at the American College. You know, just thank you so much from the bottom of my heart uh, for everything that you do out there in the philanthropy world, the insurance world, the asset managed world, huge impact on the world. So, uh, Chris Blunt, thank you so much for taking the time here to join us on this week's episode of the Framework Podcast. Again, I'm your host, Jamie Hopkins. We appreciate all the listeners and everyone out there. You know, keep staying safe, stay healthy, and, and hopefully you can take something out of Chris's story, uh, which I'm sure about to put in the framework of your own life for your own success.